semen everywhere. Marks of strangulation around her neck, flesh removed from her buttocks and thighs. It was July 26, 1959, when the death of 16-year-old Manuela Conte was declared by police to be the result of yet another serial gang rape. For the past four years, the once sleepy, peaceful city of Duisburg and its surrounding rural hamlets nestled in northwestern Germany had been overtaken by a plague of highly intelligent murderers and gangs of cunning, brutal rapists. But no matter how hard the police tried, this flood of demonic acts still blessed the front pages of the local newspapers near daily. Always another corpse, crime, capture, conviction, a reality as unimaginable as it is unwinnable. Months passed, and the cycle continued with no end in sight. Confidence in past convictions began to weaken as investigators grew suspicious. Theories mutated and morphed until, finally, the police came to an agreement. There were only two options for what was really going on. Teams of elite killers had descended on their jurisdiction, or... They were dealing with a master of evasion, escape, a true evil genius. This is the story of Joachim Kroll and his 21-year reign of terror. I didn't see you there. Something big is going on here. From hunting ghosts to Bigfoot. Paranormal, UFOs, true crime, and more. We won't just be spouting articles. I was researching for your entertainment. The beginning of a new world. <laughs> the best squawk you'll ever fucking eat. True story. It's basically like one day you walk outside and you see that the ants are playing with matches. This, this is, is the Black Cat Report. Report. See you on the other side. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 55 of the Black Cat Report. My name is Gil, and I'm joined here by our lead detective, Joey. Hola, evening. Prime suspect, Selena. Hey, you can't prove that. <laughs> and role playing for a dead body and missing person is Betsabe this week. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> now. <laughs> If you couldn't tell by the intro, for this installment of Cannibal Month, we will cover a mix of brutal violence, rape, murder, and cannibalism, while still delivering just a little hint of humor. So if that's not your vibe... Anyways, first and foremost, gotta give a shout out. Before we dive in, I want to give a huge shout out to Rooster Jr. Parrot for going to our website, blackcat.report clicking submit your show ideas on the top right of the page and submitting their request for us to cover Yoakum Kroll. So huge thank you. And also as a heads up to you, we've got your other suggestions on our list for upcoming episodes. Yeah. Hint, hint, everybody else out there. If you have ideas. (laughs) Yeah. If you want us to cover something, just submit. Yeah. And like, uh, RJP, um, has sent us like, Sent us about four or five emails so far, and each one of them is just like golden. I'm having to literally kind of sit back in like time when I'm going to like have, well, basically free time enough to like do all the research I'm gonna need just to do them like justice. Like he, get, he sent in like incredible suggestions. I'm like super stoked to dig in. What's well, that saying? Um, if you think it's good shit, you must submit. There we go. I love it. That's a good <laughs> saying. Did you make that up? Yeah. That's awesome. (laughs) Now, (laughs) before we take a stab into the body of this episode, I want to address something that's come to light. When digging through old books, news articles, and the occasional well-cited blog post, a very clear narrative began forming as I pieced together my notes. Once a more complete timeline was laid out, all the brief quotes and casual references around Kroll's story revealed a heavy, overlooked bias that none of the single sources had acknowledged. The truth about Yamaka Kroll is, well, the real story has as much to do with Yoakum as it does the police. Keep that in mind as the story builds and ties together at the end. You know, I just want to say before you get get into this, every time you say serial gang rape, I just think of somebody putting a bunch of different styles of cereal into one bowl and then just like dousing it with... And dowsing it with milk. I mean, I guess that's Fruit well, Loops. And- that's the milk comes last. Everybody knows that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Unless you're a serial killer, but um, it comes first. Uh, well, somewhere in the middle. We'll we'll see. Hmm. <clears throat> Yoakum Kroll, known locally by children of Dweisberg as Uncle Yoakum, was later known by the press as the Ruhr Cannibal, the Ruhr Hunter, and Dweisberg Man Eater. Working as a laboratory cleaner, Kroll was a tiny, almost frail looking man. Balding, big ears, and Coke bottle glasses, he always wore a light brown tweed suit coat. Neighbors living near the third floor homestyle apartment generally considered him kind, gentle, and decent. And it was said that people knew essentially right off the bat that he had a low IQ. Um, it was everybody throughout his entire life said it was very obvious the moment he opened his mouth, the moment he would start speaking with them. And this was a reaction well documented and later confessed by Kroll to have stretched all the way back to his childhood. The sixth of nine children, Kroll was born in 1933 into a family of coal miners. He spent the early years of his life in an area known as Hindenburg, Upper Silesia, Germany, a region that later became what's now modern-day Poland, or a part of modern-day Poland. Small, weak, and known locally as the town idiot, Kroll was regularly and severely beaten by his parents for anything he was accused of, not just by his parents, but also by his siblings. Between these moments of abuse, he would only receive neglect. Attention only came in the form of violence. But these years were few as Germany would eventually begin making the moves that would start World War II. Almost immediately, Kroll's father was drafted and the family was left to fend for themselves. In brief time, the struggle would come to a head as news of Kroll's father being captured and then dying reached the family. Faced with living near the Polish-German border as tensions were rising, they quickly moved from Upper Silesia into West Germany. It was here in West Germany that Kroll spent his teenage years working as a farmhand. And it was on that farm when Kroll started puberty and witnessed pigs being slaughtered. This moment, later explained in detail by Kroll, made him immediately aroused by the sight of the pig's blood squirting out and flowing on the ground. Becoming a regular trigger for him, he would eventually seek out livestock to satisfy his teenage impulses. Yoakum Kroll was a cow fucker. Move oh my goodness. over. <laughs> that documentary that you, were, like you said, like there's documentaries on YouTube. Well, I stayed up until they said... That he used to fuck animals on the farm. Mm -hmm. And then I was well, like, so, and I rolled over and closed my eyes. <laughs> so this is that, that is a point that's like kind of, again, it's, it's just briefly touched on to different areas. But when you kind of grab all these little factoids and these little details and put them together and lay them out chronologically, you start to realize there's something important about that point. Well, as a point in the timeline of his progression, this is important. He goes from fucking cows to becoming a necrophilic, cannibalistic, serial killer rapist. For the record, I don't know the proper way to order those titles together. But anyways, I guess so he was already a rapist, though, because he was raping cows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, do you go by, like, their first act to their last one, or is there a priority? Or I didn't put them in order of importance. I was just like, these all are bad. But I feel like it just flows, just when, you know? When in doubt, just put them in alphabetical order. Mm -hmm. Ain't nobody going to be mad at that. They're going to be like, that makes sense somehow. Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. Well, so far as most formative years have now associated conversation with anxiety and silence with comfort, neglect with love and rape with desire, violence with attention and blood with arousal, animals with sex, and animals with food. Again, all of this combined with his low IQ before the age of 19. And it would be in 1955, when he was 19, that the next two steps in Kroll's evolution into a monster took place. The first, his mother's death. At this point in his life, his mom was the only one that even passively accepted him, while in reality, it was more tolerance and acceptance, Kroll was now faced with no one to support him and being at an age where he would have to go survive in the world as an adult. And the second, 
her death forced him to find work on a new farm. It was an agricultural farm, which meant no love stock. I mean, livestock to rape. <laughs> Saying that these reasons are strong arguments for what led Kroll to commit his first murder might seem like a stretch, and they generally are in most cases, until you realize he took the life of his first human victim only three weeks after his mother's death. Everything was so compact into this, and it was like there were very clear, very obvious triggers. Well, I mean, cows used to be all black until he started working on the farm. <laughs> That's disgusting. Oh, <laughs> boo. <laughs> <laughs> uh. It was February 8th, 1955, when 19-year-old Kroll happened to meet a 19-year-old runaway named Ermgard Strehil. He quickly invited her to go for a walk with him through some nearby woods. She agreed. And once they were alone, Kroll tried to kiss her. She resisted, and Kroll began trying to force it. When she kept refusing, Kroll pulled out a large butcher's knife and stabbed her in the throat four times. Pretty much the exact same motion you'd make if you were slaughtering a pig. Kroll then began strangling her, blood still pouring from her neck. When she finally died, he raped her, cut open her chest, and left her disemboweled on the ground. When her body was discovered in a bunch sorry. When her body was discovered in a bush five days later, police were horrified, not just by the state of her remains, but by the unbelievable amount of semen left in her vagina. Jeez. Based solely on the skeet, they concluded she must have been gang raped by a large group of boys. <laughs> I've made it's a basically lot of a- a whole football team of, of boys. <laughs> the, the amount of like also, police did reports. Did they think they were boys or men? <laughs> I, did, I I changed it to men, and then I went back and changed it to accurately reflect what was quoted multiple times in police reports, newspapers, investigators that were interviewed later. <laughs> like they said, they large boys. groups of boys, <laughs> and I was like, what? is going on in this fucked up area of the world. Just a roving pack of boys. <laughs> just, just one of those damn roving pack of boys. <laughs> Always cutting out guts and leaving semen everywhere. Well, <laughs> not many details are available, but it was eventually confirmed that barely a year later, Kroll would strangle and rape his second victim, 12-year-old Erica Schulter. Fast forward now to 1959. Kroll was 23 years old, and I think the best way to describe him as a person, his next big discovery and the 17 years left before his arrest, is to picture the perfect mix of Forrest Gump and Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> I challenge anyone Forrest to disagree Dahmer. with this after they hear the rest of this story. Old Jeffrey, Jeffrey Gump, Gump over <laughs> So, it was June 16th, 1959, and 24-year-old Clara Freda Tesmer was taking a stroll along the top of a meadow. Kroll, walking towards her, reached for her arm to grab it, but she jerked it away. Shocked that she could somehow react so negatively to him, a struggle ensued, and Clara attempted to fight off Kroll, until they both fell down and began rolling down into the meadow. From here... They quickly began wrestling again as Kroll tried to undress her, and in the process, he strangled her to death. After raping her corpse, Kroll added a new step to his tradition. He pulled out a folding knife and sliced off pieces of her buttocks and thighs, then carefully wrapped them up and took them home to try out for dinner. Turns out, he was totally an ass man. He loved it. And later, when police asked why, why would he eat a human, he simply said, to save on his grocery bills. <laughs> wow. <Ew. laughs> he straight up, that was his quote so many times. He's like, meat is so expensive at the store. I don't know what helps me save on grocery bills. <laughs> it was so bad. You got your you got your meat, you got your pork shoulder over there, and he was walking down the aisle, and he was like, oh, that's the buttocks. That's the good I, stuff right there. He, nice and meaty. A, he's an ass man. He could have rump roast mm-hmm. for days. You call human long pig. 
Mm. <laughs> well, <laughs> so that was definitely his Dahmer moment, right? Mm-hmm. But there's more, as I promised. See, when Clara was found later in the woods, his inner gump was somehow harnessed. And after reviewing the crime scene, collecting evidence, and narrowing down suspects, police then confidently settled on their culprit. A random mechanic, Heinrich Ott, who was arrested and then charged for not only Clara's death, but multiple related murder rapes that had been taking place in the area for years. Wink, wink. Before Heinrich was put on trial, he hanged himself. Oh my god. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, he could have just <laughs> technically been a Nazi from the years before, and he was just like, you know, he's like, maybe. Because he was from those days, too. I mean, he had done it after all the shit that the Nazis did, if being, like, uh, uh, suspected of doing this was what finally he was like, I can't live with this judgment, then that's like, that's a whole other conversation. But he was pretty odd. Was that a last name joke, Joey? I loved it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Pretty you're you're going to yeah. have another chance here in a moment. Um, yoke making it. me hungry. <laughs> 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 was that a yoke Um <laughs> And so it was only a month later that Kroll would need to go on another run to his new favorite grocery store. On July 26, 1959, Kroll strangled and raped 16-year-old Manuela Conte in a city park, leaving her face and pubic hair covered in semen and taking meat from her butt and thighs. When her remains were discovered and death investigated, police concluded that it must have been a gang rape by a large group of boys. It is packs of boys rolling around. Boys. Yeah. This is, this is <laughs> like... Jesus Christ, they need like a, a neighborhood watch or something. Right, yeah. <laughs> Who let the feel... boys out, really? <laughs> <laughs> This is like y'all seen that Chappelle show skit where it's like every time cops like kill a black guy, they like sprinkle crack on him. Sprinkle crack, yeah. Yeah, that this was like the like nineteen fifties equivalent and Germany was like obviously it was a gang rape by a group of wild boys. Well, Anytime they, they see a, a boy, they just squirt them with some semen. Aha Got him. That's our I culprits. Knew you had semen on you. But they had to reassess their conclusion when, a year later, a well-known serial confessor, Horst Otto, walked straight into the police station and confessed it was him. He was charged, tried, and convicted, eventually spending five years in jail before being released when he admitted to a false confession. Is the the forest gumpiness coming in here? Like, it's just like, Mm -hmm. just the, there's like... God, also, I love why this doesn't case. everyone do that? No, I was lying. Wait, wait which I was part under of duress. the story? Oh, <laughs> like, but that confession? No, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was coerced. No, mm-hmm. come, on. come on. Well, they should have yeah. known it. They should have known it when he came in there, and confessed, and he said, "You ought to know that I was the killer here," <laughs> and they were just like. Get out of here. You're not the killer. It's fine. It's get. It's get. Puns. <clears throat> yeah. Well, pulls off the mask and it's a Alanis Morissette. Mm hmm. <laughs> They're like, know. yeah. I don't know. And his first name's Horse, too. I can't believe we haven't said anything. Horse. About that. Ooh, I can't do a horse noise. <laughs> Do you know how confusing it was, like, lining up these two people that went to jail for, like, Kroll's, like, crimes when, like, their names were almost identical? <laughs> I mean, it's funny because it, watch it have literally just been Kroll going to jail, <laughs> saying to go to jail, but he couldn't think up another name. So he just went in there as, like, different characters. But he was like, I'm horse Otto. Yeah, he Otto. Just looks Otto. Outside, yeah, yeah. There's a horse, looks over, there's a yeah. car. <laughs> yeah, car. that I'm, whole yeah, thing. Yeah. I look- am horse uh, Otto? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He well, sees an Ottoman, he's like... <laughs> well, <laughs> in 1962, Kroll really hit a steady stride. He killed his fifth known victim on April 23rd, 
Petra Gies, 13 years old, who was lost when she was out looking for a friend after spending the evening at a local carnival. When her body was found, doctors and detectives were absolutely baffled. Not that portions of her butt and thighs were missing, but her entire left arm. They spent Holy shit. <laughs> way too much time Damn. theorizing how it happened or what could have done it. I'm like, judging by how they go through everything and come to conclusions, I'm assuming they invented like a like South American cryptid that they started blaming for shit at some point. Because they just fucking, they, all of these other folks. So we've, um, let's see, so four victims now in this this range, right, um, have all had pieces of their flesh removed, right? And it wasn't just, like, bites and crap like that. It wasn't just a stab wound. It was, like, very intentional. Like, I'm you just taking yeah. cuts of like meat butchering. home. Yeah. Um, no suspicions at this point of a cannibal. No suspicions of a serial killer or a serial rapist. Mm-hmm. Their suspicions have been entirely based on... <laughs> Gang rapes by groups of wild boys. Yeah, well, and they, I wanted to say and random folks in town. In a later interview with Yokum, they asked him why did you take her arm and he said, "Well, sometimes my back gets itchy." <laughs> that and I can't reach it. He might Damn. have literally said that. <laughs> he was the he was the beginning and of the back scratcher. And it saves on my back scratcher bill. <laughs> oh my yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the oh. APB went out too, and he was armed and dangerous. That's what they said. So. Oh. Ah. Uh. This leads me to feel pretty confident, though, that they asked Vinzen Kuhn during his trial where. I'm um, sorry. Again, should have spell checked. This leads me to feel pretty confident, though, that when they asked Vinzen Kuhn during his trial where her arm went just before he was convicted for her murder, um, they were also left just as confused. Now, in all fairness here, he wasn't just a random dude this time. Vinzez, no idea how to pronounce his name, was a known child molester in the area. And while that does make him a terrible piece of shit and scumbag of a human being, it's not actual evidence, right? Which, by the way, was never presented. Regardless, he would only go on to serve six years out of his 12-year sentence. So, Going now, again, still in 1962, to June 4th, 1962. 12-year-old Monica Teffel was abducted by Kroll while she was walking home from school. He killed her and pleasured himself with her body in the exact same way that he's done the last five victims. But this time, when he pulled out his greaseproof paper and started wrapping up pieces of flesh, he didn't take the whole arm, just meat from her forearm, which would now become a regular pattern for him. So last time, he was just kind of taking home like a sampler platter, basically. Mm, Worked mm -hmm. with it, figured out what he wanted to do, came back, he's like, this is the nicest cut. And he did mention this multiple times later. He said the forearm on young women has the most, like, tender meat. (laughs) He just, he loved it. Couldn't get enough. Well, any guesses about what might happen after the police find her? Anybody? Anybody good with patterns? A roving group of boys. (laughs) Yeah, it's getting close, getting close. They bring out their turkey baster full of semen and just start squirting Squirting young boys. Semen everywhere. (laughs) Bingo. Fight fire with fire, semen with semen. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Oh my eye, you're going into the jail, son. (laughs) The only way the only way we can stop a gang of serial rapist boys (laughs) is to become a gang of serial rapist boys. Oh, that's true. God. Nah, son, yeah, just some sharpshooters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they were trained. So so everybody was correct, um, and bingo. Walter Quiker was accused and arrested for her murder. Known for being a sweet old man with a fondness for young girls, as creepy as that sounds, there was never any evidence anywhere, and anybody that said anything, including little kids, that he had ever done anything in, like inappropriate. He was just kind of like an old man that was nice and it was also not too far out of the time period but that was like a normal thing you know um so yeah there was never literally any evidence that was 
put up against him. There were no witnesses, um, and they, they there was no case, right? But besides all that, the police still tried every possible angle to charge him with Monica's murder. In the end, they couldn't get any of the serious charges to stick, and so his sentence was short, probably due to a complete lack of evidence. But when he was released, the people of Walsam, the small area where this was, began taunting and harassing him, treating him like a pedophilic murderer. His wife, unable to live with a, quote, child molester, divorced him. Shop owners oh refused God. to let him in their stores. Kids openly harassed him while the public ignored it. And in a short time, the isolation and torment led him to commit suicide by hanging himself in the same woods Monica's body was found in. <gasps> that was the nice old man? Yup. A poor old guy. Mm -hmm. And a few months later, on September 3rd, 1962, 12-year-old Barbara Bruder was abducted. Her body was never found. As a bad joke, Kroll must have been really hungry. And while Kroll would confess to killing her, the lack of evidence resulted in him never actually being charged for her murder. You know what's crazy? Is that, Kroll. like... He, well, he's very crazy. <laughs> but the police force, literally every time there's been a murder, have said it was a roaming band of kids. <laughs> and they never arrested any <laughs> roaming band of kids. They were like, oh, it must have yeah. been that old dude. They've literally <laughs> done the opposite of what they're supposed to do, of what they, like, said it was. <laughs> Where's Chuck been, you guys? You didn't hear? No. He's on the real shit. He's on the hard cases. What What? What does that mean? They got him over by the high school. D doing what? Staked out, undercover, hiding in the bushes with binoculars, watching soccer practice. <laughs> like, <what? laughs> like... <laughs> It's like they're arresting people. And we got old Joe up. over there at the playground lo <laughs> yeah. uh, locking eyes with some kids on the jungle doom. Yeah, he's just sitting there looking at the kids, like pointing at his eyes, like I'm watching you. And the kid's just like, teacher, there's a weird guy in the bush. It's <laughs> <That's> okay. That's <laughs> just like, our local like, police officer. Our... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're like, all right, so our suspect is anywhere between the age of two years old to 19. We got to go everywhere. Hit up all the preschools. We're going to go to elementary school. <laughs> Our suspect is anywhere between one and 25 people. <laughs> yes. We have to I'm, get them all. I'm assuming it's some kind of Voltron situation right before they kill, but that's mm. that we're waiting to see. <laughs> yes. We don't have that evidence yet. <laughs> So yeah, that, that was the conclusion of the case situation with Kroll's seventh known victim. Again, we've been hopping through some years here, and when he does confess to everything and is starting to remember stuff and later proves it, um, seems like he was like pretty consistently active, you know? And like that was part of his psychological profile, which everybody came to was like he was he was super spontaneous. He was super sporadic. But he had this this <clears throat> uh, certain je ne sais quoi about the way that he could like plan and like approach a situation in those like spontaneous outbursts, right? So he'd be like, "I'm doing this today," and then he would like get it all done that day, and he'd be like, ah, "I'm going home to eat," you know. So like he'd be fine for a little while. So it's yeah, he does not fit. The profiles, which again I think is part of the reason why so many people have just totally fucking overlooked him. That and the story is so fucking biased and full of holes, it's a pain in the ass to like piece together shit that can actually be cited. But nonetheless, I've got some more for you. While Kroll was known for generally going after young, isolated teenage girls, stalking them for hours while waiting for them to be vulnerable in a remote area, his fixed the eh, his fits of sexual obsession did occasionally push him to try something new, break out of his M.O., you know? As was the case with Kroll's only known male victim, 25-year-old Herman Schmutz. While parts of this event are, in my mind, kind of awkwardly funny, it stands out from the rest of his murders because he made an honest, though wacky, attempt to finally take initiative. On August 22nd, 1965, Kroll found himself near a lake, 
hiding amongst the bushes deep in the forest near Duisburg Gwausman. Sorry, mom, who's German. Um, (coughs) (laughs) He was staring into the windows of a car parked at a notorious makeout spot. He was growing anxious as he watched Hermann Schmutz making out with his fiancée, Marion Veen, the current focus of his impulsive obsessions. As time passed, Kroll's impatience proved to be a fertile ground for his imagination. He devised a plan to get Herman away from Marion so he could finally fulfill his fantasies with her. It was going to be simple. Lure Herman out of the car so he could kill him, then strangle and rape Marion before taking her home for dinner. Easy. That was good. Yeah. Come yeah. On. That, was that was pretty good. Come on. <laughs> that was pretty good. I can, I can just see, like, honestly, I can just see him looking through the window of the car and then a police officer in the other side of the car on a bush watching a watching the children's <laughs> school, just facing the complete other way. And, like, you can see them saying, being like, help, help. He's like, shut up. I'm trying to catch a killer. <laughs> God damn it, don't you know I'm on, uh, I'm on the clock? Um, yep. <laughs> oh, man, that fits into them so well. And everything you guys are saying just becomes more true as the script goes on. Please, anybody, shoot me an email. Ask me for citations. I will give them to you. <laughs> well, so with that incredible plan, super simple plan, which you know the best plans are, um, he was ready. Kroll unfolded his knife as he slowly approached the car. The couple, still having sex in the front seat, panicked, as literally anybody would, when they realized there was now a little bald man standing right next to their window. And this time, (laughs) it wasn't an alien. (laughs) 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 Committed to his plan, though, Kroll pulled back on his knife and stabbed one of the tires, fully convinced this would get Herman out of the car. But Herman, with... Common sense, though still half naked, quickly started the car and hit the gas, heading towards the closest road. Like, literally, Kroll was like, If I flatten their tire, <laughs> they'll get out of the car. I anywhere. kill him. He'll I make like... love. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, they're like, he's, he's like, He'll obviously be like, Hey, why'd you stab my tire? Mm-hmm. Who are you, know, you and why are you? Come out and approach Jenny? the man with a knife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> as, as you would. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so they started heading down the closest road. Unfortunately, the road was a dead end. Great metaphor. Forcing Herman to try and awkwardly make a 12-point turn, like that scene in Austin Powers where he's stuck in the hallway (laughs) with the little golf cart. Yeah. (laughs) This is horrible. I wish this was an exaggeration, but... Turning around took so long that by the time they were turned around, their initial adrenaline rush was wearing off, and it was at the same time <laughs> that Kroll was coming into view. <laughs> running up the road towards them, flashing his arms and wailing, or sorry, running up the road towards them, flailing his arms in the air like he was the water boy playing football, hallucinating people were chanting, water sucks, it really, really <laughs> sucks, like... He was just waving his little arms in the air with a giant knife, but he was like six football fields away from them. Like Kermit the Frog. Oh my god! Uh, I just picture that guy from uh, Sonic the Hedgehog, the bad guy, Doctor Robotnik. Is that his name? Yeah, he the bad guy, just short, fat, and bald, and. This could have easily, oh my god, if anybody, if any of our listeners ever, at any point in time in history, um, get this reference, please just just message us anywhere and I'll see it and just say, I get your reference. I'll know what you mean. But this is exactly like a scene in the new Star Wars game with Rick, the door technician, which, after I had been binge playing it for 12 hours, was one of the funniest goddamn things I'd ever seen in my life. But... Back to the story. Back to the flailing arms and the knife. So, so yeah. Somehow, this incredibly strange sight completely broke the tension. Herman began wondering, maybe this weird little dude is in some kind of trouble. And the couple had time to and did discuss this while they sat (laughs) staring down the long road. Kroll still running towards them, flailing his arms in the air with a knife. The juxtaposition of the atmosphere couldn't be more pronounced, couldn't be more perfect. The, The couple, calm, rested, discussing the scene like they were sitting there at home watching television. 
Kroll, out of breath, running in a tweed jacket, huge glasses sliding off his nose as he attempts to unleash his inner beast, still hearing, water sucks, it really, (laughs) really sucks, water sucks, it really, really sucks. And by the time Kroll got to them, Herbin was waiting, patiently confused, outside of the car. Kroll... Having had what must have felt like an hour to plan his next move, immediately began stabbing Herman. <laughs> I guess I guess what he did technically worked, but not in the way he thought. Like the literally, he got the guy to get out of his car. But I can see them with like a stopwatch, just being like, "Man, he's taking for friggin' ever." I gotta be at this. Think I got time to go pee? Yeah. 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 Think I got. Yeah, I'm just gonna go pee. Uh, he's about a minute away. It's you know, fine. babe, we could still we still have time to finish. Um, but <laughs> sorry, bad joke. Um, but yeah, so seeing this, um, Marion immediately got into the driver's seat and floored it, heading straight towards Kroll, who only barely managed to make a safety dive into some bushes before scurrying away into the woods. <laughs> sorry. Oh my god. <laughs> just this crawl trying to go beast mode after all the images and what I've seen about him is the funniest goddamn thing on the planet. Um, but yeah, so Marion though, still back to the moment. Marion, badass as hell, yanked a hair clip off of her head and wedged it into the car's horn, forcing it to keep going off while she jumped out of the car and ran towards Herman. She literally, I think one of the sources I read said like she made a mayday signal like immediately, just like in the fucking moment. It was like, boom. And That's so it's like, thinking. It's like going off in the middle of the fucking woods and then hopped out of the fucking car and ran over to her her lover, you know. Um, unfortunately, though, Herman quickly passed away from his wounds. And to make things even worse, when Marion gave her witness statement to police, her description of Kroll was that he was a dirty, unwashed, crazy little forest man. <laughs> 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 Which is the exact opposite of his usual calm, clean, modestly dressed appearance. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I shouldn't laugh at this, but it's just, oh my God. Just going Crazy, through all this. dirty and... little mountain man? <laughs> just a, like a dirty, unwashed little man, dirty little forest man. <laughs> he had been in bushes and shit all day stalking him. And it's like, what was it? I think it was like September or whatever. And so it's like still kind of hot outside. And he's in his little tweed coat. (laughs) All fucking like hot, bothered, flustered, ready to kill. (laughs) (laughs) Had been running up a fucking road for like what probably was like a minute and a half or something. (laughs) Like just that felt like forever. But slow mo too, because he's so (laughs) short. Like he's just like. (laughs) It takes even longer because he's short. Yeah, and they're just kind of like, oh, man. Oh, my God. That's the worst movie ever. (laughs) 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 But, like, oh, my God. Oh, God. Piecing together that story was incredible, y'all. I'm just saying, I I fucking love it. I fucking love it. Again, you ain't going to get this whole story in one place. Just us, y'all. Um. So, yeah, the the one time there was a witness that had escaped, right, and they got in contact with the police and shit, completely useless. <laughs> like, her, her description, the behavior, the whole process, everything was, it, it, even if the police didn't automatically assume that it was, like, that South American cryptid that came and took that girl's arm or a gang of boys out, like, raping people or something, even if they even if they didn't assume it. Maybe they asked her 15 times, are you sure there was only one? Are you sure? Mm. Okay, I know stress can do a lot of things to a woman. You probably weren't thinking mm. straight. You weren't making the right moves, you know. Like, and yeah, you probably, do you need glasses? Do you need glasses? You don't need glasses. You they're, should get them checked. When's like, the last time you get them checked? When's your husband? Oh, shit. Sorry. Yeah. Were, um, were you mm. asking for it? Were you, you know, like, did you dress provocatively to this guy? Is that? Mm. Oh, and she's like, no. Were you no. wearing a please stab me shirt? A please stab me. And she's like, no, <laughs> it was this mistake. wild, crazy guy. And <laughs> they're just like, it's so, so it was a squad <laughs> of a boys. <laughs> squad of boys. No, it was literally a crazy guy. One. Squad of boys. <laughs> squad of boys. I think I think she's delusional. She's She's got wisteria. Um, <laughs> Did you kill Out your husband? It. <laughs> was it you? Um 
well, he, he probably just left her. Um, yeah, so even if she, you know, like, even if they were, a, you know, if the police were capable of using common sense, e.g. going with a witness's description, right? Um, but, you know, we know that gets thrown out because it could be evidence. Um, even if they did try to do that, that was like the one time that Kroll completely stepped out of his comfort zone and just completely had a different approach, different motive, different, like everything was completely different about him, right? Um, besides those tiny little legs. Well, this brings us now to 1966. Kroll has now been killing people for 10 years. Police have discovered seven of the eight known victims during this time. So not bad in finding people, right? Um, that's mm-hmm. also just, uh, these numbers are all a little bit skewed, but just bear with me here. Um, so seven of the eight known victims that Kroll later had time to confess to, or confess about. Um, so how's their investigations going? Well, they still haven't seen a connection between any of the murders and are fully convinced that there are multiple skillful killers in the region, as well as groups of boys really into gang rape, and that almost every time either one of their victims are found, a strange animal has just swooped in and carefully removed parts of the body. But as challenging as this grandiose struggle has been for them, they are convinced they've been arresting the culprits. Three people have been falsely arrested and convicted, with two of them eventually committing suicide. So, out of seven, almost half, right, of the folks, like, totally the wrong, they totally had the wrong person, it was all bullshit, there was no evidence, just assumptions, and, you know, um, and this this is something that I love about their relationship with Kroll, is that both the police and Kroll, they follow their gut. Well... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but <Wow. laughs> with all this work and all their effort and all their intuition try as they might the victims would keep rising for both murders and legal accusations on the 13th of september 1966 Kroll went back to his tried and true strategy sneak strangle skeet skidoo his target this time <laughs> 20-year-old Ursula Rowling, who was walking home late at night after spending time at her fiancé's house. Well, when her corpse was discovered in bushes two days later, investigators made note of several key things. First, she was stripped from the waist down and left in a sexual position. Second, she had been strangled to death. And third, she had no bruising on her vagina, which led police to believe that the sex was consensual. Quote, the pathologist could find no evidence that she resisted rape, end quote. Fake quote. I mean, come on, man, just look at her. Lying there on the ground, angles exposed for Jesus and the world to see. Clearly she was asking for it. <laughs> end fake quote. Yeah, it's not like she would have cooperated in order to save her own life. Yeah, no, but, but in all seriousness, the incompetence of the pathologist was like about to make things so much worse like instead of considering or even knowing that bodies don't bruise after they die which might be okay for us to not know but is literally their fucking job as a professional to know that um well his conclusion that her rape was consensual became evidence for their new primary suspect adolf shekel her fiance, last seen in public together, getting tea in town while they were planning their wedding. So, after deciding to say, fuck the lack of evidence, fuck the facts, and fuck that tea drinking punk, that's our man. The police swooped in and detained Shekel. They then kept him in custody for three weeks while they questioned and interrogated him barely giving him time to sleep. When they did release him, the very public accusations made by the police department caused him to be driven out of town, less than four months after Ursula's death. When this happened, he walked alone to the nearby main river and jumped in, committing suicide by letting himself drown. Oh my god, that's three people already, right? Yeah. Uh, the... Two hanging and one one drown. I'm not gonna lie, like this this is such 
a pattern in in Kroll's like history that I it was a lot of work just trying to figure out wait was this person's death and like subsequent like you know um false conviction of somebody like was was that associated with the suicide or did it just end like this or how long did the person like the 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 literal dumb luck that Kroll has with being in the same area. I mean, maybe they went to the same school. Kroll only went until third grade. Maybe they also went until third grade. I don't fucking know. But like the the just the sheer serendipity of like his luck going through these murders, right? It, it's it's astonishing. It's very hard to keep track of how many times almost the same shit happens over and over again. The police are acting more like fucking serial killers than Kroll is. But mm-hmm. that might be a controversial statement. Well, during that same time, two months after killing Ursula and two months before claiming Shekel as collateral, Kroll murdered Yona Hark, a five-year-old, on December 22nd. In an act of strange foreshadowing, Kroll had become obsessed with seeing what someone drowning looked like. So he convinced a little five-year-old to basically get on a train with him and then travel 20 miles from her home and he drowned her in a ditch before raping her body and slicing off his favorite cuts of meat, which he wrapped up and took back home for dinner. Yeah. Wow. Yikes. I, the, the foreshadowing there, I don't know. He could have just went yeah, out but... to the main river and just waited to see this future consequences. Like, yeah. Yeah, that's that's nuts. Like, this is, and especially this is different. I feel like it's different, too, because he, he seems like he's getting younger. You know, because like he, everyone before was at least twelve and older. So like, now now the last one he killed is five. I don't know what the other if there's any coming that are younger or if anything. But he, like he's just he does gets fascinated. Yeah, it's um, I think it's mostly a case of like opportunity, right? Mm. Um, he does tend to go towards younger women, um, and like little girls, tends to, right. Yeah. But that's not always the case in point. But a lot of them are preteen or like early teens. Um, yeah, just seems like he gets fascinated with somebody he sees that could yeah. be close. You know, like he's just sitting there. It's it's tip. It is typical serial killer behavior. Is that you? He sees something like that. He's just maybe sitting at a sitting at like a coffee shop or something just looking and then he just sees like some girl in like a young girl in a white dress like walk across the street and he like sees it as a sign that's my next one you know like he just has that and then he starts getting fascinated with it and then waits to find the moment to kill him i guess what it seems like to me yeah no i mean that's that's a legit that's that's a legit take on it it (laughs) don't want to give away too much of the plot but it's He's a very difficult person to pin down when it comes to motivations. Like a very, very difficult person to pin down when it comes to motivations because he's so in between the line of like, like being a complete psychopath, right? But also like having such like low IQ, but not super low IQ so that he's functional, but he's also not functional, but he's also managing impulses and he's also managing social expectations, but he's also antisocial. And it's like, (laughs) like, because a lot of this later just has to come from like his own mouth and his own words and descriptions for why he would do certain things. And it's a lot of statements like to save money on groceries you know and so yeah. it's like yeah. it's hard it's yeah, i don't know it, it's fascinating but it's it's a character ain't no one like Joachim Kroll um thank god well Kroll never admitted to any murders between confessing about Yona in 1966 his 10th victim and his 11th victim Maria Hedigan in 1969 a 61 year old woman left raped and strangled There is a lot of evidence and tendencies pointing to him having remained active, but we'll get more into that later. Well, after Maria, his 12th known victim was a 13-year-old, Yuda Ron, in May of 1970, who was strangled and raped while she was trying to walk home from a train station. Her murder would eventually result in yet another arrest, Peter Shea, who, after having been a suspect, spent 
six years as a social pariah, hounded by his hateful neighbors and community until finally he folded, he gave in, and he went and turned himself into the police in 1976. So yeah, somebody that was 100% completely innocent was getting like just hated on so fucking terribly. And they managed to hold out for six years. They literally went and confessed knowing that it wasn't them. Damn. And that went, they weren't a serial, you know, <laughs> like confessor like the other guy. Um, but if it gives you an idea of like, you know, like the, the guy, like our boy Otto from like earlier, right? Um, he it drove him to the point of committing suicide, like the hatred he was getting in the mm-hmm. community. This just happened with the uh, with um the other victims. God, there's so fucking many. Um, with like her fiance after he got released from being questioned and interrogated for three weeks nonstop, right? Um, mm-hmm. yeah. There there's a lot of um collateral, like lives that were lost during Kroll's like career, his rampage that. I really do feel like needed to be added to the deaths yeah. that he caused, right? Oh mm-hmm. yeah, but yeah. I mean, it's it's like a, I guess he's in a way being like an atomic bomb. Like he's getting dropped on this area, and the first death he's causing is like the first blast, mm-hmm. and then later his blast radiation, radiation is yeah. just hitting other people that are involved in these things, like the the fiance that like it, who would right after your fiance gets murdered who in their right mind would like not go crazy if if they like literally right after that they get taken in for three weeks straight of questioning of being like you're the murderer we know you're the murderer you did it and then you become a pariah everybody thinks you did it and then so you're just like well like i lost my the love of my life you know at that time and you pretty much lose your world you know, you literally yeah. lose your world because you lose your status. You probably can't get hired anywhere. So, oh, fuck no. yeah. And this is yeah, probably, and, and like, this is Poland in this like, time. This, this is Germany. This is poor. Oh, he's actually in Germany? Yeah, now? they're in West Germany. Oh, okay. They're in yeah. Soviet Union, though. No, no, they're no. They're in the Soviet Union, s- technically. No, they're in West Germany. That's, that's. Oh, okay. Then, then they're, they're yeah, in the, yeah, yeah. the allied side of it. Okay. Cool. Yes. I, wa- I did want to ask that, too. Yeah, yeah, no, no. It's um the fact that they moved there, um, because you know, spoiler, like I've been saying the whole time, he does get arrested eventually. It's very beneficial that they, you know, outlawed the death penalty in West Germany. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Those are tactics like depriving them of sleep and food and things like that that like cults do in order to like brainwash people mm-hmm. and it, like you know having the like interrogations for hours and hours like. You could convince someone that they did it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Mentally, I definitely could do that. That's... Yeah. And it's, <laughs> I don't know if all the like good interrogators in Germany, um, you know, were now living in Argentina um, oh. or <laughs> like, or what happened, but. This isn't Probably even like. Probably at the, the Nuremberg trials. <laughs> yeah. This isn't even like the, the B team of like police and interrogators. This is like the C D substitute team of police and interrogators. And Kroll, so I do I'm actually gonna take this moment to bring something up. One of the things that police use constantly when they're telling their side of the story, their side of this whole situation, the the folks that were there at that time that, you know, um pointed their fingers at the wrong person or, you know, had their hunch and da da da. Um they were saying they couldn't tie any of this together because he was active over such a large area. The area was uh, 20 miles high by about 50 miles wide. This was That is a complete fucking fallacy. It is a complete fallacy. This is, it, this is the 60s and 70s. They had cars. They, had tra- mm-hmm. they, they have trains over there. We don't even got trains here. They have fucking trains. Right, they had freeways. Um, they started freeways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and like it was, you know, they were in Western Germany, right? Which means they were very like exposed to, um, well, like Western news, Western information, Western science, Western progress around like criminal psychology, and serial killers, all the fucking rage. Like this is not, 
they play the pity party and act like, how could we have possibly known? But their conclusions speak for themselves. I'm fucking sorry. But like the amount of times that they literally say, gang raped by a group of boys as the conclusion for some shit. While the same pieces of somebody's body, the victim's bodies are constantly being removed in a surgical manner. And they're just like, I don't know what the fuck could have done that. It was a, it was a chupa dupa, you know, like it's, it's (laughs) fucking absurd. It's, it's really fucking absurd. It pisses me off, but yeah. So if it was a West German butt nuzzler, (laughs) I told you about them. You didn't believe me. Yep. You Mm. did. You did. Um, (laughs) Yeah, so the that person, uh, Peter Shea, he'd been dealing with so much pressure um, for six years after the police made him a suspect, right? And obviously, it since then dropped him being a suspect. It lived on. The, the, the karma that the police brought and left on his doorstep stayed there. And he eventually just fucking turned himself in, right? Well, yeah. And this is all within the same year that Kroll strangled and raped 10-year-old Karen Tofer. And that brings us to Kroll's final murder, but not the climax of the episode. No, no, no. If I've learned one thing from Kroll, it's that when you climax, you need to make it big, inhuman, too much for any one person to possibly deliver. This might be one of the most on-brand arrests I've ever heard of, rivaling even Richard Ramirez getting beat down by the neighborhood that he terrorized. Something <laughs> so expected yet so beautifully ironic. And I mean that word properly. Like when uh, BTK was like, hey, if I send you guys a floppy disk, you guys can't trace me, right? And they were like, no, 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 no. Tracing? Send that floppy disk, girl. Yeah, we got you. <laughs> and then they, you know, obviously traced him. They're just like looking at each other, like, is this 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 guy serious? It's, like, it's, is he? Is a yeah, fucking yeah. idiot. It's just <laughs> this is this is. It's like this whole time we've just been reading, the storyline of two people. On their twenty years, twenty one years, before they met. And then we find out they were just perfect soulmates. That's that's what's happening right now. And and it all came down. Their first date, really, was on July 3rd, 1976. Four-year-old Marion Ketter, the daughter of a nearby family, was lured into Kroll's house with the promise of chocolates. A life is worth a box of chocolates. Well, this wasn't necessarily suspicious, though. As I said at the beginning, to the kids in his community, he was known as Uncle Yoakum. Publicly, Uncle Yoakum was a quiet, nice man that everyone knew had a low IQ. It was accepted that he just felt more comfortable talking to little kids. Having left school in third grade, he had a lot to relate to him about. And as far as going to his apartment, well, it was full of dolls. Kids would regularly come over and hang out while playing with them, right? And even the, the people that were in charge of kind of setting the rules for this house that had apartments in it, slash it was slightly shared living, um, they made the exception for Uncle Yoakum, right? Kids would go in, come out, you know, but they would actually come out, you know? <laughs> it was a normal yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. But privately, Yoakum Kroll also played with the dolls, but when he was alone, he would practice strangling on the dolls with one of his hands while he violently masturbated with the other. He also had a special collection of dolls, very well-used, inflatable sex dolls, but we can all assume what he practiced on those. Dancing. At least that's what a former boarding home roommate (laughs) told police later. But anyways, Kroll didn't practice on a doll that evening. (laughs) And when he was done, (laughs) when he was done, he picked out his favorite cuts and stored them in the fridge. A day or so would pass, and Kroll would make an odd comment to a neighbor as he, as they passed in the hallway at this house. Something to the tune of, don't try to use the toilet down the hall, it's plugged up with guts. Thinking it was a joke, the neighbor went anyways. After nearly vomiting, when he lifted the lid, he ran outside into the street. Police, helicopters, and small teams of parents were going door to door, looking for Marion. 
grabbed an officer's arm and started screaming. There's blood and guts in the toilet upstairs. I think my neighbor put him in there. Their response was more or less, calm down. You're not making any sense. Do you know where Marion is? Wow. Yeah, she's in the fucking toilet. <laughs> they fucking, the, the police quotes from this are just like, he wasn't making any goddamn sense. <laughs> They're doing the oh same thing we talked about God. earlier. They're sitting, like, looking the other way it's, while they're trying to... This is so incredible, but it gets better. It, it's going to keep going. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, the the man kept insisting, and somehow, literally, God only knows, he finally convinced the police to follow him up and look in the toilet. Seriously, that is a miracle. That is a documented miracle. Okay, I will say yeah. that. I'm a fucking atheist. I'm calling that a miracle. <laughs> All right, well, horrified by the sight of a toilet filled with blood and intestines, they still weren't sure what they, <laughs> where they could have came from. So Damn, they, someone had a huge bowel movement. <laughs> so they got a plumber to come <laughs> in, and together ripped the toilet from the ground and tried to pour the contents into a bucket. <laughs> Have you ever tried to skillfully pour a large bowl of liquid into a glass or like a smaller container? Yeah, so they spilled her guts all over the floor and everywhere and then just manhandled them while they were putting them into a fucking... It was already That's in a bucket. So it was stupid. in a goddamn toilet. Why did they you know what's it? funny is that the, the plumber comes in and he's just like... <laughs> they're just like, we need to find out what this is. The plumber's like... Those are somebody's guts. Somebody was murdered and they put their guts in there. They're like, but we really have to look at it. And the plumber's like, it's someone's guts. This is probably the person you're looking for. And look, he's, Joe. They're like, you're like, anyway, no. have you seen Marion? Yeah. Look, and Joe, he, you look a little hungry. You look a little tired. Were you, were you out late last night? Did you happen to grab a small girl named Mary? We got our boys. We got our boys. We got him. <laughs> the plumber. It was the plumber. The and, it makes, and it makes sense because he put it in the toilet. Yeah, he obviously put this guy. here to distract us from her being locked up at his house. We have to go find his address. Well, yeah. we got to get her. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, so so they spilled this shit fucking everywhere, all over this bathroom. The guts were there. Again, why did they need a bucket? A toilet is literally a bucket. It was already there. They didn't need to do that. They just straight up didn't need to do that. But... Anyways, well, they didn't have to remove the toilet. They could have just like with gloves, so, like so, put yeah, they could have dug the it out. Intestines into a bucket. So, so many things, so many things. But like you know, they were distracted. They were thinking about these roving bands of boys gang raping people, and every moment they were sitting there, where it obviously wasn't the little girl they were looking for, because those are guts. That's not a little girl. It's a moment that she might be a victim of yeah. this group of boys. So. I mean, you know the police officers were, like, elbowing each other, being like, <laughs> yeah, you should have seen what I put in my toilet the other day. <laughs> God damn it. Well, <laughs> probably. Um, well, it was about that point, just after they completely, completely fucked up the crime scene. I want to throw that out there, too. <laughs> and, and poured this little girl's guts and intestines all over the floor and fucked up the house's bathroom. Um, it was around that point that the officers finally agreed to go with the neighbor to Kroll's apartment. Literally like two doors away. It's right the fuck there. They're on the third floor. Mm -hmm. He lives on the third floor. It's right the fuck there. And they were like, nah, we're going to have to bring in a professional to look at these guts before we go talk to him. Like, what the... Anyways. When they got there, he was cooking. Kroll. And when they asked if he knew about Marion, he said no. And when they asked to come in... He nodded his head yes and pointed to the fridge. Oh my gosh. They opened it. Marion's head was on the bottom shelf, eyes open, staring directly at them. When the 20 year veteran officer who saw this first finally recovered from almost fainting, he checked what was on the stove. It was a stew with peas, carrots, and Marion's hand floating in the center. By the time they had gotten Kroll outside and on the stoop of the house, neighbors were gathering. 
It was said that the men in the group were making lynching motions with their hands, just fucking waiting to get to him. The police asked Kroll, do you want us to take you into custody? I wish I was making this up. <laughs> literally. They, <laughs> like, they literally, oh my fucking God. <laughs> they went in there and did like a South Park police thing. And they like opened the door, saw the head, saw the hands, and were just like, hey, it looks all good here. Damn. It's nothing, just hand soup. Yeah, damn, nothing going on here. Damn, I guess we'll never find her. <laughs> God damn it, I already told this man that keeps bothering us. We're looking for a girl, not intestines. <laughs> not a head. This is this what is an literally intricate <laughs> I th- I d- replica of Marion's head, but we can't be wasting our time with special. Look, we events. all love her, okay? We all know she was a beautiful young girl, but like, what does this? Who have? doesn't what? have a bust of her in their house? I I don't have time for side quests. Um, so, <laughs> well, they fucking asked him. Even Kroll was intelligent enough to realize I should go with you right now. Oh, yeah. As a mob of people were literally making lynching motions at him, and women were screaming, and kids were crying, and the neighborhood was like, what the fuck? Because obviously that neighbor who had been, like, you know, spoon-feeding the police along the whole goddamn time ran the fuck out of the house again. It was like, we found her, kind of. You know, like, you know, everybody knew at that point. (sighs) Well... So they regretfully placed him under arrest. A lot of shit was said and a lot of actions show it that the police were in complete denial about it being cruel. So all that is very, very on brand. And like I said, two star-crossed lovers, they were going to meet eventually. This was the fucking moment. Like the soulmates came together. And I I thought that was beautiful. I did also promise irony, and it took me a while to realize this. It comes in the form of the toilet, the clog toilet. Kroll had been making a living for years as a laboratory attendant. (laughs) He literally (laughs) cleaned bathrooms and toilets for a living. (laughs) Wow. He didn't clean this one too good. No. (laughs) But, like, out of all the fucking things that he's done and all the times that it's just been, like... Literally, do, 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 up, step, stab, come, take a stake, run away, just, oh, da, da, and it just forgets that he does shit, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, this is the one thing that he did very well and was a professional at. He didn't even fucking handle it in his own house at his, you know, like in his communal bathroom. But again, after a so, couple of pile drivers into the toilet bowl, he was like, well, <laughs> shit. That'll do. But that'll be- I'll just <laughs> tell him that, uh, uh, I have hemorrhoids. It was the burritos. <laughs> he d- he did. There there's <laughs> conflicting reports about like neighbors saying that the pipes and the toiletry was like stinking for a couple weeks. And there's reports that he at first tried to lie and say that it was rabbit guts because it was a small little girl. The intestines were smaller, but also that not that fucking small. Um, it, Damn, it's a four foot tall fucking rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. Um but um yeah, so so a couple of things here though, like that, that are so important that happen. First, how he gets caught to me just kind of seals the deal. It it shows it about like how much thought he had been putting into this the whole goddamn time, right? Even if he was getting lazy along the way. This is a very high level of laziness. Like, he didn't even go back to unclog the fucking toilet. He was making dinner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, it was not a priority. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it, he could have just not told the neighbor, and the neighbor would have been like, oh, my God, who put this here? You know, he, yeah, none of that. Um, and this also proves something else. Uh, Kroll never watched television. Never listened to the radio unless it was, you know, dance class night. Um, Mm -hmm. And so he never heard the news. He had no idea for 21 years about the searches for missing people, 
about the bodies that were being found that were his victims in no he didn't know like how like nicknames were popping none of that he was not chasing any notoriety he didn't want to live on in infamy like nothing like nothing like that at all he had no goddamn clue that there was a massive police search outside of his house straight up didn't know totally oblivious right again another check the box that you added to the side of what you know profiles for serial killers where the fuck is this dude at in the process right in the in the patterns now um is it leslie nielsen from uh Nick leslie, Gun? Nielsen. leslie nielsen leslie nielsen yeah this next guy is literally leslie nielsen detective max reese when the police department finally concluded that they were handling a murder because it took them a while once Crow got down to the station. Um, they switched departments from the, the beat cops that were kind of searching for shit to like the, the specialists, to the investigators, to the head of interrogations and questioning, right? Yeah, Leslie Nielsen, Max Reese. Well, <laughs> when he began interrogating him, at first, Crow wasn't saying a goddamn thing. He wasn't saying anything to, to Investigator Reese. Super tight-lipped. Um, actually, he was basically acting like he always acted all the time around adults, and literally everybody in the neighborhood knew that. He doesn't say anything to adults. He feels uncomfortable around adults. Maybe that has something to do with his childhood. Um, and so hours went by, and it finally dawned on, on Reese, um, maybe I should start asking him about his hobbies, and so they spent about eight or nine hours just talking about hobbies and talking about life. And it turns out they had a lot in common. And they do a lot of the same shit, and that was nice. And the relationship started to change. Kroll, or at least according to the investigator, he would say later, he's like, I could see it shift. It was like I saw for the first time, like, or I saw in Kroll that it was the first time in his life somebody was listening to him. Right, somebody was actually fucking listening to him. They weren't making fun of him. They weren't treating him differently. All this other shit. They were just listening to him. Right. Great interrogation moves. This is this is fine. Yeah. This is fine. That's the, starting know. out great. He's starting out great so yeah, far. Starting out, starting out great. And then he gets a uh, yeah. You know they they tend to make things big here at this police department. Um. So this is where it goes a little off the rails. <laughs> They're asking Kroll, you know, did you do anything to Marion? He's like, no, I didn't do anything to Marion. They're like, well, did you do anything to Marion? And they're like, no. And then he starts to admit that he may have done something to Marion. And in what I literally don't think is a move in reverse psychology, they start talking to him and treating him like he's been set up for this. The police literally start treating Kroll, who's just been pulled out of their house with the missing person's head and was cooking their hand and there were guts in the toilet that he said were in the toilet. They literally start to summarize all their shit into what I think is a little bit more um, funny and not as like a bunch of little random points of like pressure. I, I really would just, I'd, I have to put it like this. He's like, look, Quill, we know you were set up. We know you didn't do it, and we're not here to pressure you. We know the guys behind this are smart, real tough cookies. And we know you aren't capable of doing something like this, so just tell us. Who put you up to it? Who made you do it? The sooner you let us know, the sooner we can protect you from him. Look, we've all been living in fear. We're just trying to get you out. Well, anyways... Kroll kept confessing. <laughs> right? Like the police gave Kroll a way out of this situation. And um sorry if this is, I'm if I'm butchering there was a lot that goes into this moment, but 
there was pure cognitive dissonance happening at the police force. They have spent years thinking it was gangs of boys doing shit, yeah. that it was all this other stuff. Um, some of them, like, they're all still holding on to those beliefs, but this is matching the pattern of these super intense, highly intelligent serial killers that they've been doing such a great job capturing, but keep flooding into the neighborhood, right? They hadn't connected it to other to other murders yet. And they just don't want to admit somebody of Kroll's demeanor and intelligence has outsmarted them, even once, right? Because Mm -hmm. all they want is grandiose plans. They want to be super cops. And Mm so for two weeks, for up to nine hours a day, Kroll was being interrogated. And public prosecutor would later say that he gets breaks whenever he wants. Also, he's given his favorite food, potato pancakes. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So... Also, potato, he's, pan- <laughs> potato he's, pancakes. Wait, he's, wait, wait. He's given his favorite food, potato pancakes and turnip greens made by an officer's wife. Also, the guards and him regularly get together in his cell at Kroll's request to play a card game called Scat in his cell. Nobody's taking him seriously. No. All the time in between him actually being interrogated, where like at first he kind of was like, I didn't do it. And then he was like, I did it. And they were like, look, we know you didn't do it. And he was like, no, I did it. And they were like, no, there's no possible way. And we were just fucking with you earlier. And he's like, no, I, I, I did it. I killed her. I ate her. I saved money on groceries. You know, like, he just can't fucking say it. And they were like, oh, no, stop it. Stop it. What did we do? What did we start? Oh, God, we brainwashed him. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, we're Unlike too smart. Unlike the other people. Unlike the other people that <laughs> yeah. they admitted to God, doing these murders or putting them in that, you know, like the other victims or because those people that. <laughs> you know, said that they killed them, but really actually didn't are also victims of this too, because yes. they're part and of the game, which is the bad, which is a horrible thing. And I think, I think and Reese, end up killing themselves. Reese, you know, who has spent however many of the past 20 years convinced that he's been dealing with the most cunning, sinister, evil genius killers in the world and like getting them to crack, you know, he might've walked out of the room and just be like, Oh fuck. I'm too powerful to talk to a normal mind anymore. <laughs> yeah. My power of suggestion is incredible. Leslie. Blowjob. Oh, wait, uh. why'd you throw that at me? What? Oh, oh, damn it. <laughs> damn it. She's smart too. <laughs> like, you it know. only it only works on men. It only <laughs> works on men, obviously. <laughs> like, yeah. So so yeah, this moron keeps it going, keeps it and like it's trying to get him to deny. Eventually they start listening to him. And so they're like, okay, we get it. You did, you did Marion. And he's like, and I also killed someone else. And they're like, well, who did you kill? And he's like, I, I have a really bad memory, um, but I did kill a girl over here on this day a few years ago. I think it was this month. And they were like, uh, okay, da da da. Over the course of time, folks start putting the pieces together, fucking finally. And they were like, there was a murder over there. There was a blah, 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 blah. We never caught the person for that. We never blah, blah, blah for that one either. How did he know this and that about it? And so they start taking notes. Eventually, a new routine forms, right? Every time that he would admit or confess to a murder, the police and Kroll would get into a car and they would drive him out to the general area, let him get out, and let him guide them to the exact spot where the body was. And he had a pretty damn good memory of like, okay, it was by this tree, and it was this bush, but that was smaller then, and da-da-da-da-da. And he would piece it all together, and they would get there. And then a new step was added, which was reenacting his murders. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple female police officers... Um, which at this point were kind of excited, the general police force was getting excited, were volunteering to play his victim, right? While he was surrounded by cops and he was doing it. And he was showing them. And then I took her hand and then I da-da-da and then I stabbed her in the neck and then I blah, 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 blah. And like acted everything out. And the investigators, some of whom had been there for these like moments of discovery of these bodies and stuff in the past, were like, how the fuck did he know that? Wait, no, blah, blah they started giving him credit for this and they started being like, oh shit, like he is the one that did this. He, like we never released this shit, which I also like to think 
that's them saving their ass. I liked it when Crow was like, and then I put the hand over here, and he's like, fuck, I forgot to write that down. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, he was like, trying to see... update his notes on the hood of the car. Just like, no, I yeah. need a pencil. It's gray. Damn it. I got to make the ink match. You know? <laughs> like, it's just like I old ass see... reports. Sorry. I can see him being like, uh, just looking at the, what is it, uh, Crow looking at him, be like, actually, guys, I'm a method actor, so I really think I, she needs to be dead. And the girl's just like, well, you know, we got to figure out this. We got to make knife. sure he's guilty. We got, yeah, the, the other cop's like, I got a knife. I, I got some handcuffs. Yeah. Will that do? Will that do? Oh, oh um. Trust me. Actually, I don't... We used to date. She's already dead inside. Yeah, she's already dead inside. <laughs> it's like, I actually killed her with, um, I didn't use a knife this time. It's like, I used, uh, I used wire cutters. I used whatever. your handgun. <laughs> I used your handgun. And then it's like, oh. And he's just like, God. Damn oh, it. a handgun. We need an electrician <laughs> to come out. We need an here. electrician. Yeah, yeah. And they like build sets for him. So yeah, like there was a there was a trust process that was built up, right? Um, frankly, you know, Kroll was on board to like trust them way sooner than they were. And they were also it now became a novelty, right, to them. The reality of what Kroll was going to do and what he was starting to say hadn't sunk in yet. First, they were excited. Look at this idiot that's doing this and like blah, 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 and so on and so forth. They're like, shit, he is right. Maybe he's some kind of savant or something. You know, like they're fucking morons. <laughs> the, the, the proof is in their the the charges and suspects that they've had this entire time. They're fucking idiots, all right? Well, so yeah, at first, Kroll's confessions were welcomed and encouraged, quickly becoming a routine for both the police and the local press. Once they arrived near the area of a past murder, Crow would carefully walk through his memories, leading them from tree to bush to where he left the body. With his memory refreshed, he would proceed to reenact the killing with a volunteer officer, like I said. And by the time they'd leave, Crow would have not only walked them through each of his steps, but also revealed details that were never released to the public, that they had documented. They had the court transcripts. Everybody was, there were teams coming out there with him that were like, okay, we're checking, like, no, this is legit, right? I felt very confident this guy's, this guy really did it. Well, during Kroll's dramatic reenactments, not too close, but not too far away, sat members of the press, poorly camouflaged as they hid behind trees and bushes. As goofy as that is, honestly, how could they resist? I mean, these photos always paired so well with the press updates being released by the police department nearly every day. Things like progress in their interrogation with Kroll, what Kroll admitted to doing to his victims, and last but not least, cold cases he was confessing and proving his guilt for. Wow. This became a fucking media circus, and the police department encouraged it and provided all the fucking fodder for. Photos were every fucking tabloid, and now, you know, the shit was spreading into Germany at this point as a whole. Like, the photos of him saying he did a killing, did a murder or whatever, were being paired up with him literally with a body on the ground. It was an actor. It was a police officer. A body on the ground and him re- <laughs> like, you know, going through the fucking motions. It looks like it was dead bodies. It looks like this. It looks like that. It, you couldn't get more like a PG version of a murder scene, you know, possible. It's perfect. Like, they're going to eat this that shit. This was ID Discovery. Oh you my know, God. this was ID Discovery. Like, they're just like, sweet, sweet. I can only imagine, though, how funny it was to see him reenact the one murder of the fiance, the guy in the car. And they're like, no, no, no. How far away were you? <laughs> and then he was like, <laughs> <laughs> and they're just watching him run this way. And they're like, actually, uh, I didn't get the full timing. Could you go back and run again? Back? Forrest Gump. Yeah, dude. we got to do just it. Saying. Yep. And then I was I ran, running. And then I ran. And I don't even yeah. know how long I kept running. <laughs> About how far for, for you? I don't know. Maybe six I football fields. <laughs> oh, we'll go back that far. We'll, well wait it down was here daytime when I started and when I got yeah. there. <laughs> It was another yeah. daytime. Well, yeah, so so people they they obviously couldn't get enough crawl. Like you can't get enough of this. This is this is insane. Like what is going on right now? It's just, I mean like we're all listening to this episode in this episode right now. Like this, this shit's fascinating, right? If you're getting fucking real time updates 
of a serial killer's confession. Like, bro. <laughs> like, yeah, you can't beat that as news. Oh, hell no. And so, yeah, yeah well, well, while most folks were just finding it fascinating, right, and couldn't look away, right, others, like the families, friends, and communities who had been left with only a cold case after losing a loved one, they were finally finding closure. So again, you know, early on I mentioned that like the police were like yeah, kind of like doing okay-ish with finding all the bodies. They didn't find all the bodies. And they didn't always like, you know, basically put some random motherfucker in jail. Sometimes they just didn't solve them. So a lot of these families and stuff out there, again, over 20 years, um, 21 years, they were like, oh my God, we know who did it now. Mm-hmm. Right? They finally yeah. were getting some closure. And he's already in police custody, and it's da 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 Like, thank God. Like, you know, the sense of relief. Yeah, but the news of which, of, of these folks, these families, communities, friends, like, finding closure, it started to quickly spread. And it turned into hope for others. People were now waiting to see the name of the person they'd lost. Right? They wanted to see it popping mm. up in the tabloids. Mm. Now it wasn't just like, a, oh, shit, that happened. I, I hadn't heard about that yet. It was like, a, I hope Jenny shows up in this. I hope blah, blah, blah shows up. In that. Like, people's emotions are getting tied. And it's, it's all over the place. But nearly everybody is, is morbidly fascinated or emotionally invested in this. Right? It's huge. Yeah. And during this time, you know, what I would call the, the honeymoon phase between the police, the public, and Kroll, the chief inspector of the Dreisberg Homicide Commission... Manfred Kalchek stated something really interesting. I felt inspired to expose Kroll as a serial killer for as many murder cases as possible that had been unsolved for decades in North Rhine, Westphalia. Totally butchered that last part. Mm -mm. Essentially, early on, the chief fucking inspector of all this shit is just like, let him keep fucking talking. Let him admit to yeah. fucking everything. We will drive him out there every day. Like, this is great publicity for us, but also, like, finally all these fucking cases are getting closed. Everybody loves Kroll, right? Yeah. Around the same time, when the public prosecutor was asked by the press if this was fair or, I don't know, legal, to do to Kroll, the, the public prosecutor, whose job it is to charge him with these crimes, a man now widely known to have a below average IQ, that's another one on the board, um, mm -hmm. who hasn't officially been convicted for anything yet, not for lack of him trying, but because he still hasn't stepped foot into a courtroom. Just weeks and weeks and weeks of police interrogation. He's just being detained. Oh He's been mm -hmm. charged with shit. He hasn't gone to court. Like, mm. nothing has fucking happened. This is just a straight-up interrogation. Well, yeah, yeah. when the public prosecutor, Bernard Shemish, was confronted with that question, he said, quote, Crow was given free reign that if he's willing to confess, he's not questioned, and that interrogators in no way fausted knowledge of the files on him or elicited confessions through jovial dealings, assurances, and favors, you know, like his favorite food being cooked for him by other officers' wives, or um, yeah. you know, there was a lot of cake eating being too. Being able to call whoever um, he <laughs> taking to breaks play cards whenever he with into his into his cell. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I think one of my murders the was in officers. Maui. All the police like. Wee! <laughs> all like, right, all right, boys, we're going to Maui. <laughs> and balloons popped. They're like, we totally didn't put him onto this. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> y'all are real nice. Well, <clears throat> so the winning name of Kroll's cold case lottery continued to be announced daily, fully backed and supported by the police department, public prosecutor, the press, the public, and even Yoakum Kroll himself. Everybody's on board with this. Everyone was on the record as being happy, excited, attentive to all this going on, and they were until Kroll started confessing for murders the police had already solved. Mm, there you it know, is. Like, 
maybe the cases where the police publicly announce the victim's boyfriend as their main suspect, eventually driving the boyfriend to commit suicide, not out of guilt, like everyone assumed, but as a result of police confidence encouraging the community to torment and abandon him only days after his girlfriend was brutally murdered. Yep. That, you know, might come back to bite him in the ass. Or or maybe it was the case where, uh, with little to no evidence, the public prosecutor managed to convince the judge with feelings, not facts, and get the scumbag accused of murder off the streets for at least a little while. The Jeez. same scumbag who, after finishing his short sentence, because they couldn't pin him with anything was released back onto the streets into a community of people who now hated him, refused to allow him into their stores and restaurants, allowed groups of teenage boys, actual groups of teenage boys, to terrorize (laughs) him, and ultimately drove him to take a walk, right into the same forest the girl everyone thought he killed was found, and then, you know, hang himself right in that exact same area. Again, all this being painted at the time of, wow, he must have felt so fucking guilty, and I'm glad he's gone. Everybody felt yep. so fucking confident in these nimbensols that were in doing the shittiest police work in history. Everybody was geared up against whoever the fuck they claimed did whatever. So now that Kroll is starting to confess these things, and he happens to know more information about shit that happened than the people who've had 20-something years to look into it, um, yeah, uh, the, the tune changes, the tone, the, the vibe, the, the love of Kroll, that the fans kind of died down. And with each of Kroll's confessions, it somehow manages to not apply to him, but become everyone else's guilt. I feel like it's safe to make some assumptions as to why the police, public prosecutor, and even the city's judge all started to change their priorities with him at this point. To quote the judge, the public's need for information has been satisfied. Now the constitutional law for the protection of Kroll's personality has priority. And shortly after making this statement, case in point, all briefings and updates to the press suddenly ended. Kroll's lawyer who'd been blocked at every attempt to protect his client's rights, was now magically granted privacy protections. The kind of protections that, I don't know, might block the press from taking highly incriminating fo- like photos of Kroll as he's cooperating with investigators. <laughs> then, psychological evaluations came in, and when their results finally started to come in, again, multiple tests that were being done here, um started to put into question whether or not Kroll was even legally allowed to go on trial. There, that's the big one. Yeah, but... Oh, hey. he's just crazy. <laughs> Guess what? This shit keeps getting better. <laughs> but their sudden stonewalling didn't stop the inquiries, obviously. Not everybody gave a fuck about the police looking bad or the community feeling bad for itself for being terrorizing fucking assholes and trusting a bunch of morons. Um, Some folks, lots of folks, because so many fucking people had been killed, right? Not just the 14 that are being laid out here. Um, They had families. They had loved ones. People were lost, right? These are tight communities. Mm -hmm. Well, encouraged by them, press reached out, asking officials why there were no more updates coming from Kroll's confessions. The public prosecutor, Bernard Shemich, can never say that right, responded by saying they are taking steps, quote, so as not to be suspected of being keen on publicity with half information. He was giving the most information. That's that's all they fucking do with this goddamn police department <laughs> is fuck people's lives up. Sometimes not even with that, sometimes with none. And like keen for publicity, so... Yeah, and so not long after declaring that they want to be respected as professionals, dedicated to truth, justice, and more importantly, Kroll's basic legal rights, they also suddenly ended the daily police rides to old crime scenes, stopped asking Kroll to give them reenactments, and finally, stopped interrogations altogether. Quick number breakdown here to bring all this together real quick. Kroll told them that he thinks he might have killed between 20 to 30 people. During the interrogations, he was able to remember, with their help during interrogations, 
and then confess and show them how he did it. Um, or not for all these, but he, he confessed to 14 people, 14 people, 14 dates, 14 general locations. They hadn't got to go out to all those yet. The police at this point had only confirmed 11 and only got enough evidence from these 11 to charge him with eight murders and one attempted murder. So <laughs> when the police decided to call it quits and shut everything down, they'd only covered eight out of potentially 30 murders. I want to bring it back to that quote real quick about <laughs> from the fucking chief homicide investigator saying, as long as he keeps confessing and telling him, I want to encourage it. I want this. I want that. Everybody was on fucking board until the news came out. Oh, we fucked up. Oh, another one that we fucked up on. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. And people started covering their asses. So to make everything worse, the 11 that <laughs> they did confirm cleared the names of five innocent people, almost half the fucking accusations, the suspects that they brought in, charged, got convicted, and fucked up their lives. Three of which had committed suicide, most served time in jail, all of them had their lives ruined. Almost half of the cases, false convictions, or drove people to kill themselves. But even still, when the press confronted the public prosecutor with these numbers later on, he said, quote, To comment specifically on 11 cases is already a whole lot. What the fuck? Yes. What? The goddamn Did we get fuck. Their accuse? <laughs> Which is why I said the climax was after his arrest. This is this case, this history. Like, like I had no idea going into it. Like the actual plot, I I had assumed it was tracking Dude, his murders, going through everything. But holy fucking shit! Like it's oh. not Forrest Gump. It's Forrest and the Gumps. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, literally, <laughs> yeah. It, it, this is this is insane. He he basically Kroll was not only getting dinner every time, but he was getting two for ones. Like almost every fucking time he killed somebody, somebody else's life was ruined, or it somehow yeah. resulted in their death. Either socially they died, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, whatever, or physically they fucking died. Yeah. Um, the whole goddamn time, and the whole goddamn time. They had no fucking real evidence. They had assumptions. They had hunches. Like I said, both Kroll and the police meant to be, meant to be. They both follow their gut. Now, to kind of wrap things up, and let me get that out of the way. Once Kroll did um, actually go to court, which was a while later, I think it was around a year and a half after they kind of shut everything down, um, he kept bringing up in the courtroom and he honestly thought this, that they would be able to do a procedure on him that would end his urges to murder, rape, and eat humans. He literally thought he was going home after all this. Wow. Again, he was ultimately charged with eight counts of murder, one attempted murder, because, you know, that that one lady was a fucking badass, the one that shoved her, her hairpin, yeah, yeah. like, in the horn and everything like that. I'm definitely fucking attempted murder there. Um... And I think there actually was one other case, but she also gave a terrible explanation or description of him to police. Um, anyways, yeah, so the trial started October 4th, 1979, and ended on April 8th, 1982. In total, they were in court for 151 days. He was sentenced to serve nine consecutive life sentences because there's no death penalty at the time in West Germany. Benefit yep. from moving there again. He got he had the yeah, one yeah. last gump move, man. He had that one. I don't know how I got here, but they were really mad, you know. And he died from a heart attack on July first, nineteen ninety one, at the age of fifty eight. To which the chief investigator or interrogator said, "I felt like that was a little bit too soon." They did. They never dropped their fucking ego about these cases. And that's what made this script and, like, researching this so fucking difficult yet so fascinating and, like, kept me so addicted to looking into it was I started noticing just, like, brief little sentences from this investigator on this article. And they were like, well, you know, the police had a really hard time. That comes up every fucking time you look into them. They will talk about how difficult it was, about how, like, well, he didn't fit the, the description and da-da-da-da-da. That's fine. He didn't fit the description. Um... What does that have to do with all the shitty stuff you did in the meantime? What does that have to do with um, everybody dropping support 
when he started calling out your fuck ups. What it? What is that? What is all that other shit that you're using as excuses have anything to do with um only confirming eleven of the fourteen he admitted and only getting enough information for eight when he literally was telling you, "I think I've done twenty to thirty. When weeks apart, the tones of all the major players and the shit like that completely flip to the opposite end. Um. That's the fucking bias. That's honestly, I think, the real <clears throat> story behind Kroll. The murders, the rapes, the strangulation, the cannibalism. Eh, we've seen that before. Um, but to have such a documented breakdown and account with direct fucking quotes of complete stupidity and criminal incompetence is... They're the real serial killers. Fuck the police. Mm-hmm. And that's the end of this week's episode. <laughs> But yeah, what did no you guys justice, think? No though? peace. What do you guys think? I think, I think those police officers are fucking idiots. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that it's rare that shit like this happens. No, well, it's it's notoriously hard, and a lot of detectives, even the good ones, say it's <clears throat> notoriously hard to catch serial killers. <laughs> I mean, this guy wasn't trying (laughs) to be a serial killer. He was probably just like walking up to the officer with the body there like, excuse me, do you have a wet wipe? I have blood on my hands. Like, oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. Here you go, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, Yeah, I saw her last night. Oh, you did? Yeah, but was she like this? Yeah, after a little while, they're like, oh. I'll make a note of that. Well, you have a good day, sir. Like, they're fucking morons, but yeah. Yeah, I wonder wonder if a lot of this is just like they wanted to be they wanted to make a big case because yes. like the same the same time period also was Anatoly Slivkov. This is the same time period that he was in yeah. the late nineteen sixties and he was getting caught around the late nineteen sixties. The same for the uh the uh what is it, the Zodiac killer in San mm-hmm. Francisco was the late nineteen sixties. I mean, granted the late nineteen sixties and seventies is like heaven for serial killers. Yeah. That's when they all came around, you know? That's yeah. when all the notorious ones come up. So I wonder if at that time they were thinking we you know, we're great, we're these awesome people, and they might not have been tested by serial killers before, mm-hmm. you know, because they're also in Germany. And granted <laughs> the entire country it just the entire country in was being. serial killers. Yeah. <laughs> serial killer. Yeah. Yeah. They're and like, some of the police how could we possibly recognize them? <laughs> yeah. And and most of the people that were that were, I guess if you want to say in the quotations their best and brightest. Yeah. Had either left the country, yeah. been killed in the war. Mm-hmm. Or they were too young, you know. They were they were too young to get some of these jobs, yeah. Um, because they would have been the, the in quotations the children of Hitler, the mm-hmm. ones that came right after Civil War, uh, after World War Two. So like they weren't old enough to be a little bit separated from you know the National Socialist Party, the Nazis, you know. Yeah. Um, so they kind it kind of was like a, it seemed like a weird thing. Plus, they were probably also worried about the Soviet Union and the wall. You know, the so it was I feel like there was a, a lot of things happening and the allies, because most of the people are getting put in the uh, put in the what is it called? They're put in internment camps. So yeah, but there's just so much going on in this era there there. I mean, I know. there there is. But just real quick, like I I always push back when people say that because there's always a lot going on in every era. Well, yeah. And <laughs> um, also to kind of like add to that. Still not an excuse to, uh, you know, falsely imprison your own neighbors in your own community. Um, no, 100%. And, agree. And a and, uh, point that I wasn't able to confirm, but I thought it was funny. Um, uh, Kroll apparently had been enrolled in Hitler Youth, right? Um, and this was, like, before, like, Germany had even invaded Poland. Like, this is just fucking full-on yeah. nationalism has taken over and everything. Um, he had been enrolled, um, but he was an outcast, and they kicked him out. <laughs> um, Aww. He got, which is like, also, again, this dude had the most insane luck his whole life. But yeah, but yeah sorry. I also wanted to point out, like, as hard as it was for these police officers, the beginning of the interrogations was finding guts finding her head mm-hmm. in his refrigerator. Yeah. Finding him making stew with her hands. Yeah. Like that was the beginning of the interrogation. It wasn't like 
hey, we've been talking to you. Oh, oh, we found evidence. No, they had yeah. the evidence. And then they were like, what's going on here? That's how they treated no. him. That's and how they talked to him. And then they babied yeah. him. They straight, yeah. like, I yeah. read, so, I could have added another three pages of the script of, like, oh him being babied. Like, everybody was just, yeah. like, everybody, it was such a state of, like, um, of cognitive dissonance, right? Um, of just, like, there's no way these facts make reality because reality Mm -hmm. is this grand thing that makes sense to me right like they could not get that out of their fucking mind it has to be these gangs of fucking boys that are running around just raping women chopping off fucking one of their ass cheeks and shit like that and like leaving semen everywhere has to be one of them right um or it has to be Mm -hmm. literally like a an unlimited supply of the world's most elite murderers that are coming in and managing to slip past them at the last fucking second, you know? And then at the same time, some fucking animal is surgically removing specific parts of all these folks. And that, that animal has nothing to do with the the serial killers or the rapists, but you know, we got a lot going on here, you know? Um, They're fucking idiots. Like every, they refuse to put Mm -hmm. anything down that a was, was, was competent, but like B was just um realistic mild mm-hmm. um yeah. uh typical average um you know another day at the office maybe they refused to do it it's like the person that will only dot their eyes with little hearts that they fill in you know what i'm saying it's just like i can't do anything else like i don't have a hatred against them i'm just saying like that seems like the type of person where it's like no i have to go way the fuck too far every time on everything i don't care if it's a 400 page manuscript you know these hearts are gonna or these eyes are gonna have hearts like they're fucking whack they're fucking yeah. they're, they're super whack and there is a perfect symmetry that plays out here between kroll and the entire police forces across multiple areas literally being the same person right like one's personified yeah. and one's the person but it's like they're both scared as fuck of the press right Kroll didn't watch it didn't ever listen to it da 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 both scared as fuck of that um <laughs> the police don't want to fucking look bad they don't want to like uh have basically their dirty laundry like shown out for like everybody they don't want to you know all this crap like yeah. that <clears throat> yeah and I don't know. Joey, I think you saw it the other day. I literally made a massive ass list where I'm like, wow, they're the same fucking people. Same motivations, yeah. same bullshit. And again, both followed their gut. And again, it was fucked up the result each time. So, Thanks for listening to the Black Cat Report in episode 55 on Yoakum Kroll. This was our third installment in our July Cannibal Month series. Next week, we'll be peering into a really awful cannibal. You won't want to miss. You won't think of what you're eating the same way again. So remember to like, review, and follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to follow us on Instagram for the most up-to-date information. And we'll see you next week.